Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Coach Replay Show. I'm your host this week, Corey Camp. And I'm excited to have a friend of ours joining the show today, Dr. Jennifer Porter. We're talking these few months about teacher empowerment, and I think you're really going to enjoy Jennifer's take on this. Uh, So without further ado, Dr. Porter, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your background and the, the unique program that you're working with now out of UT. Thank you. I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, I'm Jennifer Porter. I'm the Managing Director of OnRamps. OnRamps is a dual enrollment initiative at the University of Texas at Austin. And this year we serve close to 42,000 unique students who are engaged in dual enrollment courses across the state of Texas. And that is that means we're also in partnership with uh, 1,353 high school teachers who are implementing our courses across 198 districts, 410 campuses, and 20 different classes. So uh, I I have the best job in the world, I think, because I get the opportunity to work with so many wonderful teachers um, who are doing their best work, um, in my opinion, and of course, the opinion of everyone with whom we get to work um, in the state. I think that's wonderful. So I know we were talking just uh, before we we kind of came on stage about uh, on the digital stage here about how you glean a lot of, um, you know, the things that you do in your role from your prior experience. So tell us a little bit about who and what you did prior to this role with OnRamps. Sure. I started as a a elementary school teacher and I was a principal for eight years before I was an assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction in two different districts. So I worked in K-12 for almost 20 years or I think 20 years. I've got kind of lost count in there because I was having so much fun. Uh, Then I joined OnRamps in 2015 to lead the professional learning and development and curriculum and course development work and have since uh, been the managing director since uh, the beginning of 2020. I love that. So you are no stranger to the idea of, um, you know, teacher ownership and professional learning, supporting teachers through professional learning, ongoing growth. I mean, that's what you do there at OnRamps um, specifically, but, you know, the, the reason this is kind of a two month theme for us in uh, here on the Coach Replay Show is it's, it's extremely vital to what we're doing. And a lot of what um, Dr. Ramadan, Kim and, and the other co-host and I want to do within this is to really em- empower our coaches, to, to enlist our coaches in really focusing on the teachers' wants and mm-hmm. needs. Um, as a way to empower them, you know, kind of uh, taking away this idea that coaching is about me coming in, seeing a deficit, making you aware of it, and we're set on a goal towards that. But really that this is a partnership in in our work together, that, that this is a professional learning experience for the teacher and that they should have some say in that. So Around this idea of teacher empowerment, I want to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, it's kind of something that you live and breathe, and I really love your take on it. So so give it to us. What are your thoughts? Well, I would first say that we do not actually empower teachers um, because teachers already have all the power within them already. They have the power that they need. So what we do is we resource teachers. We make sure that they have the resources, the tools, the opportunity um, to to pull on that power, to share that. So when we think about empowering teachers, I tend to think about that as, "Mm, you know, I don't love that because teachers have knowledge, they have skills, they have wisdom, they're bringing up um, into their classrooms, their own frameworks, their own experiences, their care for students, their ethic, um, you know, moral education. They're bringing so much into the classroom already 
Um, and that is a, a ton of power that they're bringing to the education of just that particular classroom of students and into that space. And so all that we are doing really is making sure that that is well resourced and we can provide tools and opportunities for them to extend that, to reflect, to share. And we often talk about, you know, the smartest person in the room is the room. And so when we bring our teachers together, then what we can do is facilitate a, an incredibly bright and beautiful room um, in which teachers are sharing that, that connective power, absolutely. Um, but we're not giving them something that they don't already have um, within them. I love that. I think that is such a good frame for us to work from is it's not on us to give power to our teachers, but to unleash the power that they mm -hmm. already have. Um, I, I really love that way of thinking about it because again, it, it's in, in our minds as instructional leaders, it better enables our teachers as opposed to looking at it as like, it's a deficit that I need to build their capacity because they don't have it within them. Mm -hmm as opposed to the answers are there within them. The, the potential is there, the power is there, as you said. It's just about making sure that I am leading in a way that is going to um, let the teachers utilize that, to resource them. I think that's a, a great mm -hmm. phrase there. So how does this roll into um, on-ramps and kind of mm -hmm. the theory of action? I know that, that that's something that I'm really interested for our audience mm -hmm. to um, just because I think it's so powerful to this idea. I am happy. I'm going to share my screen and kind of walk you through it because it's four parts. And when we talk about, you know, we don't empower teachers, they have that power within them. Um, we still with, even in every part of our educational facet, our own lives as professionals, we are constant learners. And so that doesn't mean we are know-it-alls, we're learn-it-alls, if I can borrow that phrase uh, from Brene Brown, I hope she doesn't mind. Um, mm -hmm. we, we always want to be learning still. It doesn't mean we already know everything, um, but it, it means that we can be active participants. And so we have a theory of action that applies to both our teachers and to our students. And it's these four pieces that uh, interlace together and are recursive. So they connect, and they drive one another forward. And I'll talk about this from the teacher frame, but of course, Corey, if you want me to talk about how this works with students, I'll go into that too. Um, and so that first starts with engagement. And when we think about 1,353 on-ramps instructors who are all high school teachers this year alone, who are stretched out across the state of Texas, which means two time zones, everywhere from the Panhandle to the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you know, if you take Texas and you want to drive across, that means a good 14 to 16 hours, depending on how many stops that you make at a particular gas station. Um, right. How many times you, know, you stop at Bucky's? Let's just say it because we know right. I'm a fan of Bucky's. <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, <laughs> then, you know, that's a lot of time and space to cover. And so we do a lot of virtual communities, virtual networking, and in that's what drives this first circle, this first circle of engagement. And so mm -hmm. our instructors have to be engaged. They have to be engaged not only with their course content, the course pedagogy, the technology tools of that particular course, but in that community of learners. And with that, what, what I will say very directly in the years that I've been with on-ramps, but also in the years in which I was a campus leader and a district leader, is that when teachers were not engaged with an element of the course or an element of what they were teaching or a technology aspect, then that meant assuredly that the students were shut out from that opportunity and the mm -hmm. students lacked the opportunity to be engaged and curious with that as well. And so that engagement drives the opportunity to make an attempt. And once you're engaged with it, once you're engaged with, you know, I'm, I'm curious about peer instruction. <clears throat> I'm going to try this out. You know, and that goes to the attempt. I'm going to try out peer instruction in my classroom. I'm going to try out this pedagogy. And then I'm going to share it with somebody and I'm going to get some feedback about that. And all feedback is, is feedback. 
And so we do say in honor, say feedback is feedback. And we try to neutralize that because we don't want to say negative feedback, good feedback. Feedback is feedback. And you can take that and do with it what you will. Um, and that can go back into how you revise your attempt, how you can inform your engagement. Do you need to be more engaged? Do you need to take a step back and reflect a little bit more before you try it again? Um, and of course, as you can see, then as you apply continuously, um, that goes in circles way back to that engagement again. So that's what those little gray lines are because each of those elements of this theory of action drive into the next circle, but then they also inform how both students and teachers um, re-engage and from the feedback cycle as well as from the application cycle. I love this theory of action because, I mean, it really does make so much sense to me. What I love most about it, though, I think is this idea of that kind of connectivity as we kind of go across these circles and then come back around again. I mean, it really, each one does fuel the next one. If, like you said, if I'm not engaged and, and curious or even aware of, you know, some some peer instruction strategies, then there's not a chance that I'm going to attempt that or any existence of it is not going to be intentional within my classroom, possibly. It might be that I'm doing some of those things, but I'm not aware that there's mm -hmm. a specific way, a best practice, uh, um, some ways to do that in, in, in some meaningful ways. So I think that that is, is powerful just to kind of see the connectedness and the, and how all of these in all these four pieces integrate within each other. So I love that. Um, and I want to invite our audience, like as you're looking at this, how does this theory of action relate to the work that you do? I mean, I think you could even think a little bit about this work of, you know, maybe engaging uh, my my learners, my teachers uh, is is something that I could work on as as a coach or how do I support that application piece um, or or is my feedback, right? Do I have multiple forms of feedback? Uh, do we see feedback as feedback, as you said? So I think this is powerful. Uh, so I'm curious then as as we're kind of looking at this and we're thinking about, you know, unleashing that power that's within our teachers, what are some ways that you do that? I mean, you, you've you talked about how uh, large of a scale on ramps mm -hmm. works throughout the, the great state of Texas. So uh, I know one of the platforms that you utilize is the Sydney platform, mm -hmm. huge fans of that, the sponsor of our show uh, mm -hmm. here. So tell me a little bit of about how you might, if we start with engagement, how that might look mm -hmm. within the vehicle that you use uh, for this. It and it flows perfectly. And we have used Sydney for many years now um, as part of a coaching model, but also as a part of the ways that we drive engagement and support teachers with the resources, with the tools, and with the opportunity. Um, and also a thing that we do within OnRAMS, with, because we have our courses that have advanced content, uh, we want to normalize struggle. We want to normalize struggle from the teacher perspective, but also from the student perspective. Uh, learning physics, pre-calculus, um, chemistry at the college level, those are all challenging things to do when you're in high school. Uh, teaching today is often a challenging task, and it can be a lonely task. Um, mm -hmm. Across our state, when and across many states in our nation, and even uh, just across many campuses, you may be the only teacher who's teaching that particular course, that particular content area, and you can't just open your door and walk down the hall and say, hey, let's talk about thermodynamics this afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. Who are you going to have that little chat with? That, that, that can feel very isolating. And so what Sydney has allowed us to do is to provide a platform for teachers to engage more significantly with one another in addition to the points that they have across our facilitated network, uh, but they can submit a sign, they can submit themselves um, and just short videos, of course. But one thing that we see is that the more that individuals are logging on to Sydney and just observing, 
Like that's one thing we want to see is just engagement with the platform of watching other teachers, of watching videos in the library, of participating in the mega huddle to check out a resource or to look at a mentor instructor. Those are all really strong signs that someone is just curious and mm -hmm. seeking to understand. And when we're seeking to understand, we're already in a development phase or in an affirmation phase. And mm -hmm. when you're teaching something that's challenging, when you're in a challenging moment or there's just a lot going on, do you have any teachers that you know who have more than one prep? Maybe, <laughs> I would suspect many have more than one prep. Um, then seeing someone else teach that content go, oh yeah, that's the, that's the main part of that. Great, check. Um, that can be very affirming and very helpful to propel and move your work forward. So I'm gonna pause there because I, I feel like I could just really keep going. Corey, is that, did that help start to answer a question? Yes, absolutely. And, and and I love that that you're sharing that you're kind of using different elements of of that platform, right, to, as a way as a digital space for um, connection, for learning, for inquiry. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about inquiry in a second, but I I see there just in how you're using the the space, right? That you've got this space where tools and resources and, and opportunities to collaborate can all be accessed. Um, and one of the great things about the Sydney platform is that that can happen anytime, anywhere from a mobile device, from a, a laptop or desktop device. So I think that's, that's really powerful. I want to circle back to this mega huddle. Tell me more, yeah. tell me more about the mega huddle. What's the purpose of it? Uh, I'll say for, for folks who aren't aware of uh, the, the tool of Sydney huddles are the places where people can come together and collaborate or be coached or receive support or, you know, be a part of a log group, large group. So what's the mega huddle? So the mega huddle is a space for each one of our courses uh, where the, all the teachers in that course, all the on-ramps instructors in that course are engaged and they share resources, we upload resources, but they can uh, upload their own videos or they can watch videos from their mentor instructors or from our own staff. And so mm -hmm. in some of our larger courses, the mega huddle might have 230 instructors there um, sharing you know, clips uh, or it might be in some of our smaller courses, it might just only be 50 instructors or 25 instructors. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are 25 voices and 25 examples that you don't really get an opportunity to see because uh, as, in, as teachers, we don't very often get the chance to see each other teaching um, mm -hmm. in the ways, especially at the same time or the same content that we're preparing to teach ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I talk about this a lot with our own team. And as I'm just sharing the great work that um, we get to do with Sydney, you know, we think about like anytime you're going to the hardware store and you're with your, you know, your partner, your beloved, and you're like, we want to paint this room blue. And they think, oh, we're going to just go get a can of blue paint. And then you get there and there's paint chips and there's at least 200 different shades of blue. Mm -hmm. And that really helps the mega huddles help our teachers and help us understand how we're narrowing in on what blue means for um, what, you know, for defining therm a, a specific term in science, if we're defining a process um, in a writing course or if we're really helping to understand the level of college rigor um, in a dual enrollment environment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. I think that's a, that's a very uh, resourceful way of using kind of the, the huddle spaces and that there's a multitude of, of opportunities for learning and collaboration to happen. So mm -hmm. I think that's powerful. I know under this same topic in, in our kind of show notes, you talk a little bit about the democratization of coaching. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. So we, the democratization of coaching kind of comes from this idea of the democratization of technology, that the more technology is you know, it's cheaper, it's more readily available, then more people can use it, the more people can use those tools. Mm -hmm. And if we think about coaching in the same way, and 
with this cycle, you know, our teachers have been engaged and they are curious. And so then they decide, I'm going to try something out. I'm going to, uh, and I'll keep using peer instruction as an example in our physics course, that's a particular pedagogy we use. So peer instruction has seven specific steps. And so they're going to video themselves, at, you know, with a portion of peer instruction. And then they put that in the mega huddle, or maybe they don't. Um, there's a couple of different ways that this might go. And, but let's say that they do put this in the mega huddle um, and they get feedback. And this is where the democratization of coaching really comes into play because mm -hmm. who can be our coach? Who do we allow to be our coaches? Um, being a coach can and should in many, many circumstances be a position that is highly trained and elevated. Uh, Rafa Nadal has a coach, he's a tennis coach. Now, I would love it if every single teacher had a highly trained professional coach assigned to them for one on one who could stand there and say, Great shot, try that again, one more time. That's not how teaching really works. Mm -hmm. um, but you can have people in your professional education circle who can, who you can endorse, who you can assign to say, I believe in you and you know the things that I know, or you are someone who I see has knowledge about the course, knowledge about what I'm teaching. And if you tell me that was a great shot and I should try it again, that has value for me. And so that means you're my coach, just like Rafa Nadal has a coach. And, and that could be specific to the course that I'm teaching, the context that I'm teaching in. And you can assign value and give an individual that kind of um, opportunity to give you that kind of coaching in the structure of these mega huddles. Um, and that's what we've done again in the mega huddles with our mentors. Um, but it's really about listening to who you're going to allow to give you feedback, and who you might say, hmm, I, I'd like to know a little bit more about you before I allow that feedback. But that's part of what yeah. goes into the safety of the mega huddles and the course specific nature of them. Hmm. You know, this, this makes me wonder as we think about this idea of, yes, we have, we have these individuals who are assigned, you know, the, the, given the title of coach or something similar to it. And that's a part of their role. But we also have somebody across the hall who um, I know I could learn from. I know who could, I would value their feedback in a specific area. And there's also other people in the building who I may not be aware of that I would value. I, I just don't know enough about them yet. Um, I love this idea of you can find somebody who can be that coach for you. Um, kind of anywhere and, and and that you you've created in the mega huddle space the opportunity for somebody to think about who who could be your coach who could who could provide that feedback for you that's going to drive you forward or cause deeper reflection it i wonder though as you as you've created this culture in on ramps where that obviously is happening within these mega huddles did you have to do anything to prepare your um, folks for that level of kind of like the peer to peer feedback. Is there anything that you might recommend as a resource for those who are maybe wanting to create those kind of environments? Yeah, yes, I think we did. And we really started with, you know, if it's to be, it, it begins with me, uh, that kind of concept of it starts with me, but also with leaning on and connecting very closely to appreciative inquiry. And when we start with feedback, when we start with this attempt here, one of the things that I loved the most about Sydney when we very first began, um, and I recorded my very first video um, that I put up, which was about how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or no, I, I believe it was um, how to make the very best sandwich, which mm -hmm. I'll cut to the chase and to say the very best way to make a sandwich is to have someone else make it for you. That's <laughs> the best kind of sandwich. Those are the best everything. Yes, yes, that is. <laughs> um, 
So those are the directions. <laughs> but when I made when I made my very first video, and I recorded my very first video for Sydney, and I loved that you could record it and you uploaded it to your private space first, mm-hmm. and you watch it yourself first before you send it on to a one to one huddle, or send it on to a collaborative huddle, or to a mega huddle, or anywhere else. You watch that first, mm-hmm. and. We started that in our very first moments with our with our team of setting up the concepts of and applying the concepts of appreciative inquiry. Mm-hmm. And I drew on that from my when I had been a campus principal and a, a district leader as well from some of the Project Zero work that comes out of Harvard, where of uh, doing instructional rounds um, that I had implemented when I was a campus principal. And mm-hmm. when what we had done is my teachers had done rounds, they had post-it notes, and we set up norms that you would leave a post-it note for in classrooms, um, but you would only leave something that was something that someone had done well. I really liked the way that you did this. I'm gonna take this back to my own classroom. We all benefit so much from having someone point out something to us that we are doing well. Mm -hmm. And when we connect that back to James Clear, Atomic Habits, Mm -hmm. other psychological work that tells us how to build habits, it is so much easier to keep doing a habit that you're doing well than to stop doing something you're not doing well. Mm -hmm. And if we think about teaching and all the things that we're already doing well. The teacher who's monitoring students very well and affirming students on the right track, using excellent vocabulary, and and starts to just continue to build on those positive practices, pretty soon they're just ballooning all those positive practices and creating this incredibly collaborative and positive cultural classroom space because Mm -hmm. we've been pointing out all these great things that that teacher's doing and it's hard to reflect on and see how the things that you're doing well, hard to see that yourself. So to have mm-hmm. someone else point that out um, is really valuable. When you watch a video of yourself, to intentionally take a step back and say, I'm only going to look for the things I did right today. Mm-hmm. I'm only going to allow myself to point out, here's what I did well in this video. And here's what I'm going to do well tomorrow for the benefit of my students. That is a very additive way to continue to grow your own teaching, to continue to grow the, your beautiful classrooms, your wonderful classrooms. And it's a, a positive appreciation of one another. And so mm-hmm. if you look at your own work with appreciation, you're looking at others' work with appreciation as well. And those were early norms that we set, set in our Sydney practice and have continued on um, explicitly and implicitly. I love that, you know, especially because, I mean, video and and that that level of reflection and and vulnerability, Mm -hmm. video is one of the most cringeworthy experiences when we're self-reflecting, right? When we're watching Mm -hmm. a video of ourselves doing something, uh, it is the, I mean, every time I watch back our episodes here on Coach Replay, I'm like, but it is powerful. I mean, it really, it really is one of the most powerful tools that we have for uh, reflecting but also for mm-hmm. sharing. Um, it's one of the, uh, it's, it's extremely economical, right? Uh, it's it's readily available. There's a number of ways to share it. Sydney is, is safe and secure. So that's mm-hmm. why it's such a great tool for that. Um, but it can also just yield so, so much more opportunity for those who engage in that kind of practice because it can be access, accessible anytime anywhere. It's not necessarily tied to the stars aligning and us not having a million and 10 things on our PLC agenda. When we come into the same room to talk every Wednesday, you know, you can really dive into some deep practice. And I think this idea of appreciative inquiry really does take a little bit of that, that burn away from that, what we typically tend to do, right? We are so hard on ourselves. Um, And we're going to probably notice all the things that don't have anything to do with teaching instruction, (laughs) teaching and learning uh, in that video. So to, to kind of set that before I even push play on myself or someone else's video, what can I appreciate? What can we 
keep doing from here, I think is a really important strategy, especially this time of year Mm -hmm. when we are like using the last, we are running on fumes (laughs) this time of year. We're waiting for that winter break so much. Um, so I, I love that. I think I, I think that's going to be something that I take and immediately apply in my next coaching conversation, encouraging my, my coaches to make sure that they're doing that. And like, we're not even going to look at anything else that we could do better, but let's just identify what we could keep doing. Um, I love that. I think that's, that's a really great way to unlock the power within our teachers. That's fabulous. And you mentioned Atomic Habits, one of my favorite books. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, so. I, that book is excellent. And I've learned so much. I've read it at least twice and I probably need to go read it a third time so that I can uh, continue to improve some of my habits and, and keep growing in them. Um, I, know. I, I also like what you said here, because with, again, with Sydney and with some of our technology tools, that democratization of technology really facilitates the democratization of coaching yeah. uh, because we can share and we can coach ourselves. We mm-hmm. can use that technology tool to, you know, one, be kind to ourselves and to identify within ourselves. Here's what I, here's what I did well today. Here's what I can do well tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Here's something that um, I can contribute to my students. Here's something I can contribute to my fellow teachers um, mm-hmm. and to boldly stand up and say, Hey, I, I've got this. I can, here's something I've got. That, something you know, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really where I fell in love with video. Uh, Gosh, I started using it in my own classroom, probably trying to think of how old my oldest is now, maybe 15 years ago. Um, I gauge everything by how old my kids are now. Uh, But, but I, that was the thing that I thought was so powerful is you talk about kind of value and feedback. I was teaching special education at the time and I had wonderful instructional leaders, but was they they were very quick to say, I haven't taught self-contained. I haven't taught Mm -hmm. resource. I, you know, I can give you some pointers, but I really don't know how that works in the special education world. And so while their feedback was valuable, you know, they were hesitant to say, here's what I think you could do to, to, to improve. Or I was given feedback that I was like, I mean, is that really meant for me? Or is that what they would tell somebody who was not teaching this content? Mm -hmm. And I was the lone wolf on my campus, you know, as, as Mm -hmm. a special educator, didn't have access to others. And so I didn't begin recording for my own reflection and growth, but that's quickly what it turned into. Um, after I deleted the first eight videos in the first five seconds and then watched the ninth one all the way through, (laughs) um, I realized like, Oh, I have some things that actually work out pretty well. I now understand the positive feedback I've received from some of the instructional leaders. I can see it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then there were other things that I was like, Ooh, I should work on that. Um, I'm still working on some of those because it's harder to break a bad habit than it is to to keep doing a good one. I love that, that, that that's a great takeaway, at least for me in my mind today. Yeah. I, it's amazing. It, I was an assistant principal in 2002 and the principal I worked with, she and I, um, I don't remember what the exact rules were at the time that facilitated this, but we allowed, we said, teachers, if you want, you have an option to record your teaching um, as a supplement to whatever the formal um, Mm -hmm. appraisal process was, um, but, and watch it with a peer and then, you know, we'll do this alternate process. I think there must've been a new rule across the state at that time. Right. Um, of course that was 20 years ago. So I don't remember the rule, um, but that required checking out a camcorder from mm-hmm. the library, setting it up on a tripod and then, then taking the VCR, the, the VHS tape and then getting the VCR and watching it. And that um, big TV yes, room. Yes. Yeah. Which, yeah. which several of our teachers very gamely did. And it was a really great experience. Um, but that was such a multi-step process mm-hmm. and it really is just so encouraging the way that there's just so much ability now to be able to do that so rapidly. And in such small chunks, you know, if you have a an area that you're focusing on in your own instructional work, or I'll say instructional leaders, administrators, things that you're working on yourselves, 
Mm -hmm. I, I'm always working on running more efficient and more focused meetings and launching meetings with greater purpose. It's always a lesson to me that I could record the beginning of a meeting and put that in Sydney and watch it and see how that goes. It's, this is not things that are only scoped for our teachers. They're mm -hmm. things that we, tools that we can use to coach our own work and just seek input mm -hmm. from others on. Um, but that's, that's, it's so facilitated by the technology that's available. Yeah, yeah, it really is, it really is. Well, Jennifer, it's been so fabulous having you kind of challenge our thinking around teacher empowerment today. I really am taking that to heart because uh, I know when I first read kind of the, the show notes, I was like, yeah, yeah, wait, what? Now I wanna change the whole theme for, for but I can't because we're in the middle of it. But, <laughs> I really do love how you've challenged our thinking, how you've given us some great frames to think from uh, and, and how we kind of move through the professional learning process and how that can be, um, you know, inward and collaborative and with, with a formal coach or an informal coach and, and that it can be this positive experience that happens. So thank you so much for bringing that to us in our show today. Uh, thank you. And thank you for the work you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to remind everyone that if you like what uh, Dr. Porter has shared with us, or you're interested in on ramps and hearing more about that program, you can find how to follow Dr. Porter or reach out and learn more about Texas on ramps in the notes and takeaways where you'll also find a kind of a summary of some of our big talking points from today's episode, some, some useful resources to reach out to and back to as well. So thank you, uh, Jennifer, for joining us today. I know we'll have you back on again, uh, hopefully next season uh, or maybe later this season. We'll see. Um, but thanks again for joining us and everyone else tune in next week for another episode of the Coach Replay Show. Bye, everyone.